So now that you've gotten some kind of basic primers on neoliberalism and globalization, what those terms mean, and kind of started to start kind of talking about how they impact different people from different social positions, I really want to dig deeper into these links between globalization and global poverty. So I want to do a quick review first of neoliberalism and really just kind of give you that basic definition that we went over before. And that basically neoliberalism is this idea that a free and unregulated market is the key to economic growth. Uh, otherwise known as trickle down economics. And that those tenets of neoliberalism that we went over were government deregulation, privatization of public resources, cuts to social spending, and this emphasis on individualism and personal responsibility. So the thing with neoliberalism, this happened kind of domestically within the United States and the UK and other Western nations that were adopting these processes, but they also happened on a much larger global scale. And we've also talked about globalization and the different components of globalization so that um, you know, capital can move faster and more efficiently between nations and this kind of uprise and this flow of people from one country to the to another, right, in search of things like employment or education, for example, right, and that globalization happens within a neoliberal context, which what that means is, is as neoliberalism was gaining ground as a political and economic um, set of policies and ideologies that um, world leaders really kind of had their sights on how to maximize profit and how to accumulate wealth for the economic elite on a global scale. So not only how can we make money in our own countries, but how can we kind of make money in other countries as well. And there are two really key institutions that come into this. Right? And those are the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So these two organizations, you actually used to fall under one um, kind of umbrella in, uh, entity called the Bretton Woods Institute. Um, and they eventually broke into World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization. Um, and so, you know, People like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and other kind of neoliberal world leaders were trying to really kind of quickly and rapidly stimulate economic growth in their own countries. And again, and with this idea of wealth accumulation for the economic elite really kind of at the forefront of their minds. And even though Western nations were experiencing some deflation and some kind of economic stagnation during this time, which means they weren't experiencing a lot of economic growth, this is like mid 1970s into the 1980s, um, a lot, they had a lot of developing countries who were in debt to them. And what they figured out was that they could leverage that debt to open up those countries to investment in a way that would maximize profits, um, but also really kind of left people living in those countries in the dust. And they used the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to do this. So what the International Monetary Fund was is it offered um, debt forgiveness, right? So you can go through this kind of debt forgiveness program but there are some conditions you have, your country has to undergo these sorts of changes, right? And the World Bank, what they would do is that they would offer grants to developing countries for development projects. So like urban infrastructure projects and stuff like that, right? So they would offer developing countries funds to either uh, relieve them of their debts or to begin development projects. But in both cases, it came with these sorts of sets of conditions that any country receiving these money, these monies were expected to comply to. And these sets of uh, changes were known as structural adjustment programs or SAPs. And so what they did was, you know, these loans were offered by the World Bank and IMF um, to basically to countries experiencing pretty extreme economic crisis and who were living with a lot of debt. 
And so in order to receive that loan, the receiving countries had to agree to these sets of changes to their economies, the structural adjustment programs. And these are some of the changes. These aren't all of them, but these are kind of some of the key changes that structural adjustment programs would require of um, any country receiving one of their loans. Liberalization of markets, which basically means opening up their markets to foreign interests and also like reducing tariffs and other barriers, barriers to trade. Um, they had to open up the country's economy to foreign direct investment. So basically that meant they had to uh, make it easier for foreign companies to kind of set up shop on their land. So that might be a U.S. company um, setting up their manufacturing industries on that country's land, or maybe a McDonald's wants to come in, or other kind of ways in which uh, people from out of the country could come in and set up shop on that land and any profit that they took could be then taken out of that land. And so it was kind of like this wealth kind of accumulation happening on the land, but the people who were living there weren't actually receiving it. It was then leaving to um, the U.S. or the U.K. or some other kind of higher power nation. Um, they were expected to privatize state-owned enterprises. So remember, that's a key factor of neoliberalism, that they had to privatize public public owned resources. Um, they had to devalue their currency. And what happened is that this exacerbated poverty and economic crises for countries receiving a loan. It was kind of touted as this, you know, we're going to kind of uh, relieve you of your debts, right, if you just go through these changes, but really is what it made those economic conditions worse. Um, it was highly profitable for industrialized Western countries who could bring their business into the country with fewer labor, tax, trade, and environmental laws, but for the people who actually had to work in those conditions with the fewer labor protections and pay and environmental laws, they kind of suffered greatly with this. And Joseph Stiglitz, um, he was a former senior vice president and chief economic advisor of the World Bank, um, who eventually left that position and actually wrote a book called, um, you know, Globalization and Its Discontents. Um, and this quote here is from another piece called Making Globalization Work, um, where he kind of talked about his experiences there. And remember, this is a person who was kind of on the on the front lines of all of these changes. And he said, I became convinced that the advanced industrial countries through international organizations like the International Monetary Fund, the World Trade Organization and the World Bank were not only doing all that they could to help these developing countries, but were sometimes making their life more difficult. IMF programs had clearly worsened the East Asian crisis and the, quote, shock therapy, unquote, they had pushed in the former Soviet Union and its satellites played an important role in the failure of the transition. So even Joseph Stiglitz, who was kind of at the front lines, really kind of saw that not only were these programs not working and that they were making things worse, but he also kind of did wonder whether this was actually the end game overall, was to actually make conditions worse because it was more profitable for these more industrialized Western countries. And so to give you a little perspective on um, what these changes kind of accomplished, right, um, is like I said, it really kind of exacerbated poverty or in other words, made poverty worse in the countries that received these loans. And so the following statistics kind of give you an idea of sort of what the gap between the rich and the poor look like now since these changes came into being. Right. So the first is that there's now this increase in the income gap between the fifth of the world's people living in the richest countries and the fifth in the poorest countries. Um, the richest 358 people on earth have the same wealth as the poorest 45% of the world's population, or 2.3 billion people. Put another way, 300, the 358 richest people on earth have the same amount as wealth as the poorest 2.3 billion people on earth. The top three billionaires have the same wealth as all lowest developed countries combined. 
or 600 million people. The wealthiest 1% of the world's population controls 40% of the world's wealth. The wealthiest 10% of the world's population controls 85% of the world's wealth. And the bottom 50% control 1% of the world's wealth. So really what the outcome has been of structural adjustment programs on a global scale is that they've created an immense wealth gap between the rich and the poor on a global scale. So when we talked about globalization, I talked about this idea that globalization was an increased interconnectedness with one each other, with one another, but also an uneven interconnectedness. That we all are affected by globalization. It's a part of all of our lives and it does make us more interconnected and it does say, for example, increase opportunities for intercultural communication but we don't all experience globalization in the same way. And so what structure, and so what this, um, these changes under structural and adjustment really kind of show is how people who were already living in poverty in developing countries across the world, um, and once they accepted these loans and had to undergo these changes, actually found their experience worsen. And for those of us who are living in these more industrialized Western nations, we are in a position in which at least most of us kind of benefit more than they do from this, right? We have cheaper clothes to buy. We have other cheaper commodities to buy. We can get them faster, right? But we've also suffered some um, losses, such as like loss of jobs, right? As these manufacturing jobs moved overseas. And so what really what the outcomes of this has been of structural adjustment programs is that they're neoliberal economic policies, and they've created this immense wealth gap between the rich and the poor. And so the last point that I kind of want to leave with, um, as you kind of go into your discussion activity on um, researching your clothing, and as you watch the film Close to Die For, that neoliberalism is is an economic practice, but it's also an ideology, and it's a it's a cultural frame and a, a set of cultural traditions and practices that really kind of create a frame through which we understand the world. And I want you all to be thinking about this as you do the discussion activity and watch the film this week and kind of do your readings for um, from inter globalizing intercultural communication, right? Because we've talked about intercultural praxis. And these ports of entry into intercultural praxis of inquiry and framing and positioning and dialogue and reflection and action. And I want to kind of come to framing and positioning for a second. Globalization and neoliberalism influence how we're positioned because they influence the relationships between different geographic locations. So between the United States and the UK and those countries and Africa and those countries in India and Bangladesh and some of the other countries that you're going to be researching and learning about over the over the course of the week, right? We're positioned, we have a very specific social position within this larger context. And it's important to understand what that position is and really reflect on that. And in relation to that, it also gives us a frame or in other words, a, a perspective on how we see the world. Right, whether we're living in the United States or whether we're living in Bangladesh, right? We experience globalization differently because we're positioned differently. And so therefore we have a different perspective. Right? And the film is gonna go into that a bit. And so I want you to be kind of keeping that in mind as you're watching the film. How do positioning and framing kind of come together um, with uh, textile workers in Bangladesh? So with that, here are my references for this particular lecture. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me. You can also look into these books a little bit more as well to um, get a little bit more context. Um, Jason Hickel, A Short History of Neoliberalism is actually online, and I highly encourage you to find that if you want to read more about it. It's very accessible and pretty short. Um, so with that, thank you, and let me know if you have any questions.